Hey everybody, uh, my name is Aaron Stone. Uh, welcome to the van bench in my kitchen. I've been going to Watershed uh, pretty consistently for two years. But I actually used to work at a church with Matt in Jacksonville when he was a youth pastor. So I've kind of been around since the very beginning. Um, I play guitar sometimes in transit, um, but I'm actually uh, in another band and uh, we tour quite a bit. So um, I'm not surprised if you have never seen me before. Um, I moved to Charlotte um, with a bunch of my friends uh, in May of 2007. We chose to move into a neighborhood on the north side of the city called Optimus Park. And uh, we moved there on purpose to try to just love and focus on one neighborhood. Just try to be the gospel there and just be the hands and feet of Christ. And just to see what it would be like if we loved one neighborhood consistently and sort of took it as our mission field. Um, uh, we just do whatever we can do to help people out here. We throw free cookouts and offer beds to the homeless and just fix whatever people have broken, whatever we can do to help people out is sort of what we try to do. In short, I live in this house, on this street, with this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and sometimes this guy. Today we're going to be talking about the difference between guilt and shame, uh, which is something that affects me daily, um, and especially when we're on tour. When we started our band, we didn't just decide to be a Christian band or to just write songs about Jesus. Um, it's our belief that if we really love Christ, that He should take over every single part of our lives and that should just flow naturally out of our music. Um, but sometimes when I go on stage, I just don't feel up to it. I just don't feel worthy of, of speaking about Him. And, I, and I'm sitting there with like this hope and this truth that can only come through Christ's death and resurrection and I just don't feel like I'm worthy. I just feel ashamed of, of who I've been that day. Or, or that I'm not good enough. Actually, I wrote a song about it on this record, and it occurs to me that most of our misunderstandings um, about who God is and His truth is is usually based on our feelings. The Bible says that our feelings aren't trustworthy. Um, so I go to the Bible instead, and Romans 5.8 says uh, that God showed His love for us, that while we were still sinners, He died for us. 1 John 1.9 says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Mm. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite writers, and he said uh, something about this that really impacted me. He said, A great deal of our anxiety comes from not really believing in the forgiveness of sins, from thinking that God will not take us to himself again, unless he is satisfied that some sort of case can be made in our favor. But that would not be forgiveness at all. Real forgiveness means looking steadily at the sin, the sin that is left over without any excuse, after all allowances have been made, and seeing it in all its horror, dirt, meanness, and malice, and nevertheless being wholly reconciled to the man who has done it. That, and only that, is forgiveness. And that, we can always have from God if we ask for it. Lewis went on to say, Christ died for men precisely because men are not worth dying for, to make them worth it. So, so I reject my shame, and I choose instead to believe in God and in His Word, and His Word says that I'm loved and I'm forgiven and that my guilt is just him disciplining me, but that there's no room for shame. And Jesus once told a story uh, to his followers to help explain his intense love and the extravagance of his mercy and forgiveness. It's going to be the centerpiece of our discussion today. So I'd like to go ahead and read it and think about what it means. It's in Luke 15. It starts in verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Forgive me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who went to his fields to feed his pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. 
Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called on one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving away for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fatted calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Before I go, I just want to leave you with one last thought to kind of summarize everything that is going to be said today. This is my good friend, Mike Kwan. Hey. He's one of my best friends in the neighborhood and just came to the Lord hey. two months ago. And uh, he's got a real gift, so I'm going to let him say it, because he says it way better than I do. I was dead in my sin and Satan was my undertaker when I gave my life to Christ. I was something like a constipated. Remember thinking in my head I was my own savior. Despite my wicked thoughts, you still shown the kid favor. You reached out your holy hand and saved me like a lifesaver. See, I used to be a sinner like Saul, but now I'm a repentant like Paul. Because when sin's knocking at my door, I know just who to call. It's you. I used to think that there was no hope for me. Getting saved, praising God was just a joke to me. But then I switched lanes up like Pokery. I had to realize God was the antidote for me. I don't care if the world's not knowing me. I had to take the weights off because they were slowing me. Your word is so true and on this journey you're showing me. Holy, holy is the Father. But if you don't have Christ, then why should you bother? So this is for all the sinners. You need to be a soon repenter. Because I'm telling you, from me and his experience, he'll forgive us. Amen. <laughs> Thank you guys. Grace and peace.